Hello and welcome to Gold and Silver Assets. I'm Diora and it's Sunday the 20th of June 2021. In the comment section, I've had the occasional comment about how US is the dominant force in the precious metals markets. Is that true though? Let's take a closer look at this. You will have come across the golden rule which says, he who has the gold makes the rules. So who has the gold? This map shows how 20 countries and institutions hold 88% of the world's gold reserves. Almost a quarter of this is held by USA. Now, of course, these figures all rely on self-reporting, and I do suspect that there are likely to be some discrepancies between the official and the real figures. In some cases, they're going to be over-reported, and in others, they're likely under-reported. And in each case, the reasons will be strategic. On the face of it, it seems that USA holds the most gold and therefore makes the rules. But this is a bit too simplistic. Let's dig deeper and look at this in other ways. This chart shows the total world gold reserves from 1950 to 2012, and it's subdivided into Eastern and Western countries. Gold reserves means gold held by a central bank or a treasury. And we can see that overall, gold reserves steadily fell after 1970, but then began to increase from around 2007. And they've continued to increase past where this chart ends. And even at the present day, it's higher than shown in this chart. But we can see here that from 2007, Western reserves have remained stable, maybe slightly increased a little bit, but the overall increase can be attributed to increases in Eastern gold reserves, as shown in red. Here's another way of showing that. The yellow bars show that the total world gold, gold reserves, uh, basically that's shown in tons. The red line shows the Asian gold reserves as a percentage of world reserves. And we can see here that the percentage steadily rose from 3% in 1950 up to 22% in 2011, and it's even higher now. Overall, we can conclude that during the fiat era, the Western central banks seem to be net sellers of gold, and the Eastern central banks have been steadily accumulating gold over decades. Here's a chart showing some of the buying and selling of gold by central banks in 2020. We can see that the big buyers are all Eastern countries. So we've got India, Russia, Turkey, UAE, and so on. Now, according to this, Germany apparently sold a few tons of gold last year. I didn't, I didn't know that. The West doesn't seem particularly interested in gold, and actually, they seem quite keen to get rid of it. In fact, the President of France recently tried to persuade the G7 to sell their gold reserves to raise funds to bail out Africa. My question is, why can't they just print currency for such a bailout? I mean, it's, it was good enough for their own citizens. Now, of course, not all countries hold gold reserves. And in fact, 88 of the 188 member countries of the IMF have no gold at all. Here are a few examples of such countries. New Zealand hasn't had any gold reserves since 1991. Croatia and Norway are the only countries in Europe with no gold reserves. And back in 1965, Canada apparently held 1,023 tonnes of gold. Now it holds none. Let's look beyond central banks. This chart shows fabrication and investment demand for gold, with the east shown in red and the west shown in blue. We can see that the whole time the east has been in a strong uptrend. In the West, however, demand dropped substantially from 2003, and by the time we reached 2011, it was a quarter of that of the East in terms of tons of demand. 
Let's drill down further and look at which countries consume the most gold. Here we can see that China and India came out top. Third is USA, but look at the big gap between those two. USA consumes less than a quarter of the gold India uses. Also note that the majority of the countries on this list are in the East. Let's drill down and look at household gold ownership. In India, gold is seen as a symbol of wealth and status. Gold is also considered to be auspicious and is gifted at ce celebrations and festivals. It's very difficult to get figures on private gold ownership anywhere really, but it is estimated that in India, households own over 25,000 tonnes of gold. That's more than triple the US central bank. Most of that gold is in the form of high carat gold jewellery. The situation is similar in China, with gold traditionally being gifted at celebrations and festivals. Now, I couldn't find a figure for total Chinese household gold ownership. However, it's estimated that annual purchases are around a thousand tonnes each year. Okay, so if there's so much gold buying going on, why isn't the price of gold higher? Now, this chart goes from 1970 to 2020. In red is the spot price of gold. The blue line shows the theoretical price of gold if every day from 1970, you bought gold at the 3 p.m. UK time, held it overnight and sold it at 10.30 a.m. UK time the next day. This would basically make the price of gold $20,000. The black line is if you bought gold at 10.30 a.m. UK time and sold at 3 p.m. UK time. This gives gold a price of $3. As far as the paper price of gold goes, this suggests a tug of war between the East and London, with London being a very strong suppressive force. But as we know, this is achieved through the use of paper contracts, not physical gold. The throughput of physical gold through exchanges tells a very different story. The Shanghai Gold Exchange is the world's largest physical bullion trading market. Standing for delivery is actually very normal over there. And on this chart shown in red, we can see that the withdrawals of physical gold from the exchange have steadily increased over time. In contrast, over 90% of gold futures contracts on the COMEX are not settled by delivery. Having said that, it does sound like this trend has been changing more recently with more people asking for delivery. Now, even so, I doubt that this is going to reach the same levels as we're seeing on the Shanghai Exchange. Overall, to me, this all suggests that the West is accumulating paper contracts in gold, whereas the East is taking advantage of the resulting low prices. And using that to accumulate physical gold. They're not complaining about price manipulation, they're capitalising it. That's what I postulate anyway. In conclusion, as we all know, the spot price of gold is not the same as the physical price of gold. We also have to bear in mind that paper gold is not the same as owning physical gold. Cultural attitudes are also important as far as gold is concerned. The general population in the West has developed a neutral to negative attitude towards gold. And the majority of people actually don't own it, except for maybe a few bits of jewellery. Eastern cultures, however, revere gold. And even the poorest villagers in rural areas own it. So overall, we can see that Eastern central banks are buying gold. Eastern households are 
buying gold. Physical gold has been and continues to flow east. Next up, the market update. Well, we have had quite a shocker of a week, haven't we? So the Federal Reserve were talking about maybe increase, increasing the rates in 2023, and that caused the markets to completely freak out. Now, let me give you a bit of an analogy about that. So I'm rather partial to these things here, the gooey caramel in nice chocolate here. Oh. Yeah, I love this stuff. Anyway, that's like me saying, in 2023, I think I'm going to just stop consuming these things. And as a result, the stock price of lint, if that exists, um, will just crash today in anticipation of that happening. Well, what are the chances of me stopping consuming these things? Well, the only way that's going to happen, I reckon, is if they stop selling it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's unlikely. And and look, I don't think it's going to really affect the stock price of lint somehow anyway. Right. So let's start with gold priced in US dollars on the weekly scale. And look at this candle. This is a whopper of a red candle. We, had, we haven't seen many of those. Not as big as that anyway. I think the last one was over here, which was last year. And of course, that was that was temporary. It sprung back pretty nicely after that. Is it going to do the same here? Well, what I've done, of course, this was there was quite a bit of panic with all this as well. And obviously, there was a lot of dumping of gold, um, well, paper gold anyway, um, over this time. And this was quite a bit of a shocker. Um, me, I was expecting. As, as I've hinted at a few times, I was expecting this to go up to about 1950, 1960 and then get a harsh rejection. Um, so this actually happened sooner than I expected. And is this something to worry about? Well, at the moment, so far, not necessarily. If I, if I join these two lows here, this actually fits with this low here as well. And so... Until this breaks, I'm still not too worried because we are still in an uptrend over this longer time span. Now, of course, on this time span over here, which is a bit shorter, a few months, um, that is in a downtrend. And, and at the moment, we haven't had a higher high. So we do have to be careful and consider both sides. Um, if we get a lower low so basically if we break this trend line and break this low then yeah that would be pretty bad news i don't know which is going to happen but we've got to consider both sides but look i'm still positive i think that there is potential for this to drop a little bit further down to this line and i think that's still going to hold though but well we'll see we'll see but yeah this was this was I think I think the reason that I think a turnaround is going to happen is just the, the size of this candle and the kind of degree of panic that came with this, as we will see in you know the mining stock chart as well. Let's look a little bit more closely at that. So this is on the four hourly scale for gold, and you can see how rapidly this declined here. But the reason I'm another reason for kind of feeling like this could turn around, we've got support over here, a fair amount there at 1740. Um, this trend line here is at around the 1730-ish level. So yeah, as I said, there is potential for a little bit more downside, either at 1740 or 1730. So just watch out for that in the week ahead. But I think there's a chance that we could turn around here and can resume our upwards movement here. Remember that in a bull market, shakeouts like this are pretty common in the precious metals. And so you, you just got to have strong hands if you have a strong conviction about the bull market. And I do, I do, based on all the things that I've spoken about in multiple shows previously. But yeah, that's the thing about um, this is shakeouts are very common. 
This is that parabolic curve that we talked about a while ago. This, this dot here was from that uh, March low. And right now we're just around here. And so this is still within the within this parabola that hasn't really broken over here. So again, still not too worried at the moment. Let's move on to silver priced in US dollars on the weekly scale. And again, a big candle. It's not as big as this one here. That was pretty harsh there. And on the weekly scale, this still doesn't look too bad, does it? I mean, we've got uh, we've got this trend line moving up here and we haven't quite reached it yet. So there is potential for a little bit more downside over here before we turn around. And that would still be in keeping with this pattern over here. As before, uh, I had thought that we would I, I'd wondered whether this was a triangle or a flag and I was expecting a move up to 30 before getting a harsh move, harsh kind of push back down to about 27. I think I said that a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. But again, that actually happened sooner than I thought. So really the main resistance level here is the 28 level. And, you know, we've never really closed above that anyway. So maybe I should have, you know, considered that. But yeah, these things aren't easy. Um, yeah, so we've had, I mean, the good news is that we, we've, we've got this um, harsh pushback here, but, you know, we've got, we're getting it over and done with now. So that makes it kind of, I don't, if we get to 30, I don't think we're going to come back down to 26 now. I think that's less likely now that we're getting it out of the way earlier on here. And yeah, so a little bit more downside just down to this trend line is possible. It doesn't have to go all the way there. If we break that, then um, it's still it's still not a disaster because we need to really break this low here at about, I think that's about 2380 there before we'd start, start to be a little bit concerned. And of course, 22, once you go below 22, yeah, I think that's, that's bad news. I don't think that's going to happen though. I think we're going to keep within this pattern. And if you look, this is kind of forming a, an ascending triangle pattern, which is bullish. So this is just all part of pattern formation and you are going to get down moves. And that's just how the pattern forms basically. And here we have silver in US dollars on the four hourly scale. So just zooming in again. And, and so this is just to really show you the potential there for a little bit more downside, maybe about 2530, I think um, that would that would take us to down here. So, yeah, that might occur next week. Here we have the GDX on the daily scale. And look at that, there's a massive gap there. And again, that just that just indicates very, very strong emotions, panic. And you know what we do when everyone else is panicking. Rub our hands together. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm not too worried about this still. Um, how low can we go? Well, there should be a bit of support over here at about 34 but also maybe about 32.50 ish, 33 over here. So if we do get a bit more downside in gold, then I would expect this to go a little bit further. But I'm thinking that we're gonna turn around here. What we don't want is a new low below here. That would be a bit grim. But yeah, as I said, this is actually quite normal price action when we early in a new trend, which I think we are. So, We've had this downtrend and because here we've had this higher high over here, that makes me think that we are in a new trend. So this is normal. The shakeouts like this happen and it's not it's not individual to the gold market in particular. That happens in stocks as well and that are completely unrelated to gold. So, yeah, just uh, that you kind of get that by just watching price action. Here we have the silver miners on the daily scale, SILJ. And yeah, I think last week I said I'd kind of reach peak boredom. And it looks like that's going to be stretched out even more. We're just going up and down, up and down through this. 
This price action here I thought was promising because you're kind of knocking on that roof there quite a number of times. And eventually I thought that was going to break, but alas, no, it didn't break. And we're back in this area here. So more boredom ahead, I'm afraid. Um, is there more downside? Yeah, potentially 15. Could, could go down to 15, I reckon. We've got a fair amount of support over there as well. I'd only get worried, as I've said, if we go below this line here. So until we do that, I'm not, I'm not going to start panicking. This is all just normal price action and it's just dragging on longer and longer. But look, the longer this drags on, the stronger the breakout. And if we do get an upwards breakout, that's great news. If it's downwards, well, hmm, OK, just be aware of that. That's all. And I thought we'd end with some discussion about art again. So some of you might have seen this piece of artwork, which was sold for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. And it's titled Banana Duct Tape to a Wall. And uh, imagine paying that much for something that's just going to rot or get eaten. Crazy stuff, hey? And yeah, that's called art. Well, I thought that was crazy enough, but recently this piece of artwork got sold and this is titled I Am. And some would call it empty space, um, but the artist says that this is an immaterial sculpture and it's not nothing. He's been accused of, of selling a sculpture that's non-existent. But he says, no, it's not nothing. It's actually contains matter within it, particles. It's a kind of vacuum, I guess. So it contains energy. Um, so that actually sold for $18,000 at auction. Amazing, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, those you might think, well, what those what have those two got? got to do with gold and gold and silver and money and finance well i kind of think that in times where we have a hard money system so particularly when money is is basically gold then the art of those times tends to involve a lot of workmanship takes a lot of time to produce and it's very high quality. It's hand produced. There's no kind of machine, you know, kind of um, automated machinery involved in making it, you know, and it's produced by kind of it's, it's artisan. So um, in times of easy kind of fiat money, basically, I think things like this tend to happen increasingly. And I mean, if someone can afford to pay $18,000 for something like this, it kind of, I mean, there's, there's just so much cash sloshing around the system that is looking for somewhere to go. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's completely crazy. Anyway, so this piece of artwork, it's whoever, whoever bought it, they need to apparently have a room that's five foot by five foot um, in order for it to be placed there. There's no kind of particular lighting conditions that are necessary, but you need to have that space to display it. Right, anyway, um, and finally, I know that uh, we had a couple of people who were interested in seeing some more of my artworks. And I don't just do um, paintings, I do do 3D work as well. And I actually, I couldn't find a picture of it. I don't know. I seem to have lost the photo, but basically I did a sculpture called Mango Duct Tape to a Wall. And it was amazing. It was amazing. But unfortunately it got eaten before I was able to sell it. And this is my latest piece. So it's called I Am NZ Edition. So look, this is this is an immaterial piece of artwork. And I've got multiple that are available and you do need to have some space, but um, I made them smaller. So they're two foot by two foot. So people are more likely to have available space for it. And look, 
I'm going to throw in free delivery. I know it's I know it's a long way to send things to people all around the world. So yeah, free delivery on this. So if anyone's interested, uh, I'm going to consider auctioning them off. Well, anyway, I hope you have a good week. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we shall see you next week. All the best. Bye.